Okay, we're going to uh, we're going to continue on here uh, with what we've been lecturing on. Try to gain a little bit of ground there. Uh, so first off, uh, any questions on sort of how to name out Kane? So really, it's all about really with organic chemistry, as I've been mentioning, sort of uh, finding that longest continuous chain, uh, finding the groups that are attached, again, numbering in case of alkanes, always the smallest uh, number for the groups will always be the priority of what you're looking to do. And then again, alphabetical order when you do it. The main thing that people sometimes will miss uh, when they kind of go to name these things is they really won't check all the possible options in terms of that longest carbon chain. So sometimes people get into a really bad habit, always just looking at the straight one that's right in front of you, kind of straight across. So make sure that you really do sort of check all of your possible options. <clears throat> so we'll continue on a little bit more here with alkanes and talk about some of the properties of alkanes. Alkanes, um, are basically have their properties based off of really what they're made out of, which is really carbons to carbons and hydrogens. And as we've talked about, they are essentially all kind of nonpolar bonds that we got going on here. Definitely the carbon to carbon, uh, carbon to hydrogen. So a lot of the properties of alkanes do come from the idea that uh, they are nonpolar. They will use for their intermolecular forces, which is how they basically interact with other molecules, including themselves. Uh, they use the dispersion forces, which are these really temporary, weak type of interactions that occur. And that's why we see, as we will see here, uh, a lot of the properties of alkanes are uh, they have very low melting points and boiling points. They do go into the gas phase very easily because of that. Um, it's a very weak interaction. That's why a lot of the first several organic compounds like methane, propane, butane, they're all gases, right? Did we use them, right? They create fire and heat um, as we go through it. <clears throat> so alkanes with one to four carbons are typically gases at room temperature because of these really weak interactions that they have between them. So again, our methane, ethane, propane, and butane. Um, alkanes, five to eight carbons are highly, highly volatile liquids. How, I can't say that word. Highly volatile uh, means that it could go into the gas phase really easily. Again, let's see, Adobe Flash. I still don't want it. Thank you. There you go. All right. Uh, so... Our first four are really gases. And then, like I said here, uh, a lot of those other ones are very volatile. And that's why they do go into the gas phase really easily. That's what highly volatile means. Pretty much you just look at it and it will go into the gas phase, which again is why a lot of times when you're dealing with organic chemicals, you oftentimes will do it in the fume hood because they give off a lot of fumes and stuff like that because it's very easy for them to uh, kind of go into the gas phase. <clears throat> Those with nine to 17 carbons are liquids with higher boiling points. Uh, things are found like motor oil, uh, mineral oil, kerosene, jet fuel. Uh, alkanes of 18 or more are basically like waxes. And we'll talk about those when we get into like fatty acids later on. And uh, 25 or more are things like uh, petroleum jelly and, and those type of things. Really a lot of organic uh, sort of alkanes uh, they come from really long chains of just carbons attached together, like how we get our octane, right? When we fill up our gas tank, it was just eight carbons. Um, and they, what they do actually is with a process known as cracking. They essentially crack these chains into smaller amounts of carbons. And uh, basically, that'll give us different sort of properties, like maybe uh, like oil, uh, maybe like gas, uh, maybe like jet fuel, depending on what you crack it uh, sort of into. The reason why um, alkanes with more carbons have higher boiling points than alkanes with smaller carbons is dispersion forces. The strength of dispersion forces increases with molar mass. So the more carbons there are, the higher the molar mass, the more electrons, the stronger the dispersion force will be. 
versus something like methane, which is a less carbon, uh, not a lot of molar mass going on there. So it'll be the weaker the dispersion forces. Density, alkanes are nonpolar. That means that they are also going to be insoluble in water. Water is polar. Water and alkanes don't really mix really well because water is a polar molecule and water wants to use hydrogen bonding uh, to interact with molecules. And that's a bond between the negative side of water, which is the oxygen, and like the positive side of water, which is the hydrogen. Uh, so when two water molecules sort of get together, that is how they interact with one another through hydrogen bonding like that, opposites attract. But when an alkane tries to interact with it, it does not have the ability to hydrogen bond. Now, sometimes people think, well, don't doesn't something like an alkane have a ton of hydrogens and shouldn't it be able to hydrogen bond? And the answer is no, it cannot because in order to be able to hydrogen bond, you need a bond between hydrogen and either nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine, which is what we do see here in water. But this hydrogen is attached to a carbon, which is nonpolar. This hydrogen is attached to a carbon, which is nonpolar. So although that guy's got a ton of hydrogens, it cannot do any type of hydrogen bonding. It's kind of like a neutral sort of atom. Uh, it has no way to interact well with it. So when those two get together, uh, basically the oil will sort of, or the organic guy will float, and the bottom layer will be the water layer in that case. So typically... If you look at a test tube that has an organic and water in it, usually the water layer there is the bottom and the organic guy is usually the uh, sort of top layer. Most of them, again, are flammable in air, as I mentioned, because they are volatile, they go into the gas phase really easily and they can ignite very easily. So things like methane, propane, butane, you might be familiar with, obviously creates fire. One of the reactions that alkanes could undergo is the combustion reaction that we talked about when we talked about types of reactions. Pretty much if you take any type of organic compound, which contains usually carbons, hydrogens, and sometimes oxygens, and you add some oxygen to it, it will always make CO2 and water. That is a combustion reaction. Pretty much if you see those three things, CO2 and water on the product side and O2 on the reactant side and some type of organic compound, uh, that is definitely going to be a combustion reaction. <clears throat> What's that? Uh, carbon, hydrogen, or oxygen is an organic compound. So basically it's a compound that contains carbon, hydrogen, or oxygen. So another sort of reaction that alkanes undergo, uh, in addition to just a combustion reaction, is one that was referred to, here's combustion of butane. There it is. Uh, here's our combustion reaction. Again, we see CO2, water, and O2, and some type of organic guy. And here's some really badly ones here. <laughs> Or come out good, so we won't look at it, I think. Um, but let's talk about another reaction that an alkane will undergo. So an alkane reaction can also undergo what is referred to as a substitution reaction. And there's really kind of a couple of types of reactions in organic chemistry. One is a substitution reaction, uh, which is much like it sounds like something comes in and substitutes out something else, kind of comes in and kicks somebody else out. Another one's an addition reaction, as we'll talk about later on, and an addition reaction, uh, things are added to it. So in this case, when a substitution reaction, if we have an alkane, say like this guy here, And we add some type of halogen to it, let's say like Br2 or Cl2 or something like that. It will do basically what is referred to as a substitution reaction. And oftentimes it will do what is sometimes referred to as a monosubstituted reaction.
And basically what will happen is any one of these hydrogens in this particular case, any of these hydrogens, they are all basically what is referred to as being equivalent. They're basically all the same. So what happens in this case is one of the bromines will come on and one of the hydrogens will basically come off. So they're basically going to substitute from each other. One really important thing to remember when you draw sort of products of reactions, which is what you'll have to do as we go through these chapters, sometimes people want to always draw all these weird things and make weird things happen. And the truth is, in most cases, it pretty much will look almost like the original thing that you started with. So the nice thing about that is, for the most part, uh, the only thing I played with was the hydrogen at the end here. That means everything else that is there stays there. So you pretty much could just copy what's there and you'll be in good shape. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to copy exactly what was there originally, except for obviously I'm not going to copy the hydrogen I'm going to take off. And then really all I have to do at this point is put on what I was going to put on, which is a bromine. And in this case, when the hydrogen comes off, it is H+. Plus. And when bromine, the second one that's there, that is Br-. Minus. And what do you get when you take H plus and Br-? Minus? They come together and make... HBr, yeah? So that's what happens to the rest of the pieces there. The guy that comes off will join up with the other halogen and make HBr. You technically could uh, put that Br on any of those hydrogens and it's all the same, right? The name of that guy would be bromoethane, yeah? So two carbons, ethane, bromine group. Uh, in this case, there really doesn't need a, need a number because it could only be carbon number one, no matter where you put the bromine. If you put it on the other side, it would be carbon one. You put it on this side, carbon one, so it would be the same. Um, <clears throat> this is what is referred to as the monosubstituted product in this case. So why don't you try one? Let's say we had uh, something like this. And we'll add some chlorine in this case, which is Cl2. And why don't you do one more? Oh, that hydrogen came off the screen. Huh? Uh, come here. That piece it on, hopefully. Uh, why don't you do, uh, say, this one here? All right, take a moment, draw what you think you'll get out of each of these reactions. My idea, we got an alkane, we got a halogen substitution reaction. Once again, you can choose any hydrogen you like. So uh, what's going to happen is this guy is going to go off and this one is going to go on in its place. That means that basically everything should look exactly the same on that guy. So all he has to do is frankly copy what is in front of you. Uh, so we'll copy it exactly the same. The only difference is obviously we will take off that hydrogen and we will put on a chlorine in this case here. The H plus that comes off will then kind of hook up with the Cl minus and you'll also make some HCl as the other thing in that case. Any questions on that one? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, on any any of those hydrogens, you can put the Cl. So, for example, if you put it on the guy on the left instead, it's really the same one I drew, it just turned. So it's exactly the same. So you can put it at any one you want. Yeah. Other questions? <clears throat> All right, same thing here. Uh, this is a cycloalkane. Remember that hiding in here, right, are some hydrogens, right, at each of these spots. So once again, we could do the same thing. We could choose any of the hydrogens there to go off, right? And this guy is going to go on in its place. And once again, nothing else will change. So I'm just going to draw my triangle and I'm going to just draw my bromine coming on there. And once again, you will get HBr as it comes off. And you could also put the bromine on any of the other two carbons 
and it would be exactly the same thing. Yeah. Any questions on that reaction there? So basically, alkanes want to go those two reactions, a combustion reaction, which is always O2, CO2, and water. Obviously, you get usually flame and heat, and they will do a substitution reaction. And in most cases, if you're asked to draw that, uh, it's usually what is referred to as the mono substituted. So just take one hydrogen off and put one on. Technically, under the right conditions, all the hydrogens could be replaced by the, the halogens if you let it just kind of go, stuff like that. Any questions on alkanes here? All right, then let us talk then about some other functional groups, which are alkenes and alkynes. Alkenes functional group is the carbon-carbon double bond is the functional group. Remember the functional group is the part of the molecule that makes it a certain type of organic compound. It is also where pretty much all the activity occurs when it's doing a reaction. Carbon, carbon triple bond is our functional group there for alkynes. They are based off of, as you can imagine, the alkanes. So we still count the carbons, uh, but we do a little bit different in terms of the naming. So uh, once again, here we have two carbons, all single bonded. This is, as we've been talking about, will be ethane. A reminder that if we make a double bond here, we do have to lose two hydrogens and we will end up with a double bonded guy that looks something like this. And it is still based off of two carbons, except that it has a double bond. So it's an alkene and this is known as ethene, E-N-E, -E, instead of ethane, which is A-N-E. And obviously if we do our triple bond, we lose two more hydrogens to get to our triple bond that we see here. And it is now an alkyne, which is ethyne, Y-N-E. So ethane, ethene, ethyne. This has the general formula of CNH2N as the general formula for it. For alkynes, it is CNH2N minus two. Uh, so, for example, on this last one here, we have two carbons. Two times two is four. Minus two is two hydrogens. Yeah. This guy here has two carbons. Two times two is four, has four hydrogens in this guy. Uh, so we are how we get all of our guys there. Again, we're basically losing two hydrogens every time we put that double bond on. Alkenes and alkynes, they are unsaturated. Yeah. Because of the double bond or triple bond, they do not have the maximum number of hydrogens they should have, like an alkane. So they're sometimes referred to as unsaturated hydrocarbons. Uh, again, as I mentioned, they contain either the double bond or the triple bond. They are unsaturated because, again, as we've been talking about, uh, you cannot add a bond without sacrificing hydrogens, which means they will not have that maximum number of hydrogens. They react with hydrogen gas to increase the number of hydrogens uh, to become alkanes. So we'll talk about that reaction a little bit later on. That's what is referred to as an addition reaction as to what happens. We can identify again the alkenes. It needs to have at least one. It does have a double bond in actual geometry that we see from an alkane to an alkene. If we look at this carbon, for example, here, it has, in terms of electron pairs, it has three electron pairs. That would be one, two, and just like Lewis structures, double bond counts as one. So that is three electron pairs. It also has one, two, and your double bond counts as only one bond, three bonds. So because of that double bond, what happens is it gets the geometry of what is known as trigonal planar or triangular has a bond angle of 120 degrees. That is our equilateral triangle that we talked about when we did geometry. If you look like that guy right there, nice triangle act. Actually on both sides, there's a triangle happening basically on both sides. So as we'll also talk about in this is because of the double box, everybody into place. So when you have a single bond, 
the groups that are there can really rotate freely about the single bond. So that's why when we say we could draw it up, we could draw it down. It doesn't really matter where you put the groups because with single bonds, put the double lock everybody into place and no longer rotate. Wherever the groups that are locked into that place in sort of three-dimensional space, which creates, as we'll talk about, a different type of isomers uh, that occur because of that. Ethene is uh, sometimes called ethylene, um, but most people call it ethene. Uh, again, um, comes from the breakdown of plants and flowers and trees. Alkanes will have that, again, triple bond. And because of the triple bond, it actually will have a different geometry as well. When we look at the triple bond here, or this carbon, which looks like this. And if we did our geometry based on it, uh, this carbon has one electron pair. And again, this triple bond counts as only one electron pair. So that is two electron pairs. It also has one bond and two bonds, which means we actually end up with a linear geometry, which is 180 degrees. So it actually will straighten out as you put a triple bond on it. It will not really be zigzag shaped like we see with single bonds, which is because of tetrahedral. Double bonds has more of that triangle type shape as they come together. And now it really will straighten out, which is why we kind of see it drawn almost like a straight line all the way across there when we look at it. So as we lose hydrogens and we add bonds, it does affect the geometry of how those molecules come together. Um, if you have a line structure and need to write a double bond, you know, you could do it like that is perfectly okay. If you have a triple bond, you could also do it like this and just add an extra couple of lines. In reality, though, you will sometimes see people draw the triple bond like this, kind of just straight, and then maybe start to zigzag. And again, because it's sort of linear, but for us, it's okay if you want to still kind of do the zigzag shape and you know just kind of draw your triple bond in there. It's okay. So you don't necessarily draw it with the geometry correct when you do line structure, but you'll sometimes see it straighten out uh, when you do it. All right, so identify the following compounds as an alkene or an alkyne. The first one there would be. First one it would be an alkene, yes, as it has a double bond action happening there, which is obviously right here, yes. This guy on the bottom would be a alkyne. Again, you can see they kind of draw it straight because of the triple bond, but it's okay if you don't, and that would be an alkyne. So why we're here in have these guys up. Let's talk about how we do go about naming these guys. We really still follow the basic rules uh, that we do for alkane. So we're still going to look for the longest continuous carbon chain. Now there is a slight change when you're doing this, which is the longest continuous carbon chain needs to have, in this case, the double bond or the triple bond if you're doing an alkene or alkyne. So you got to have the longest carbon chain that contains the functional group in it. So let's take a look at the first one. If we were going to name this guy, we're going to go longest carbon chain is going to go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. If I counted right there, I hope, right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. All right, so eight carbons is still going to be based off of octane, but this has a double bond. So octane will become octene, yes, E-N-E. -E. Now, another difference between alkanes and alkenes and alkynes is the double bond or the triple bond actually takes the priority. So it's kind of the most important thing when you're numbering. And you also need to give the location of where the double bond or the triple bond is located. 
So we want to give the double bond or the triple bond the smallest number. So in the case of the top one, we actually have two ways where we can number. We can number this as carbon one, carbon two, carbon three, carbon four, carbon five, carbon six, carbon seven, and carbon eight. If we went the other way, that would be carbon one, that would be carbon two, that would be carbon three, that would be carbon four, that would be carbon five, that would be carbon six, carbon seven, and carbon eight, if you went the other way, right? Now, going in the blue direction, since I got blue on my pen, where does the double bond start? At which carbon? At number five, if we went the blue way, right? And if we went the red way, where would the double bond start? It would start at carbon three. So once again, we do want to give the priority to the double bond, our triple bond in this case, and we still want it to have the smallest number, which means we actually should number this guy in the red direction, yes. So incorporating into the name where the double bond starts, this would be known as three dash octene. The three is where the double bond is located. Octene means that we have eight carbons. ENE means that there is a double bond in that stretch. There's clearly nothing else attached there, right? So it's just, that would be the name. If we did have other groups attached, we would do the same thing. We would give the number where those groups are attached, but still the priority in terms of numbering is the double bond. So whichever way you decide you need to number to give the double bond or the triple bond the smallest number, all the other groups need to be numbered the same way. Any questions on that there? All right, then why don't you give the bottom one a go? It looks like fun. So see what you come up for a name on that one. Need to include the triple bond. Uh, so uh, that would be carbon one. By the way, at the end of this would be carbon number two, oftentimes missed. That would then be carbon three to here, carbon four, carbon five, carbon six, carbon seven, carbon eight. The other option, again, because you do need to include the triple bond, that would be carbon one to two to three to four to five to six to seven. So that looks less than eight, obviously. And I think that's all your options. So it does look like eight is the longest. So once again, uh, let me put a little dots there so we can see it. Uh, so this is carbon one. This is carbon two right there, carbon three, carbon four, carbon five, carbon six, carbon seven, and carbon eight. Yeah. And again, mostly missed that guy right there. Yeah, so at the other end of the triple bond. Any questions on that one there? So eight carbons, obviously we identify this as an alkyne, should be octyne, right? Y-N-E. We then want to number it to give the triple bond, in this case, the smallest number, which means which way should we start numbering? Left to right, we definitely will do it, right? So if we go the other way, it's definitely going to be more than one. So that's going to be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. Now, in this particular case, that means my triple bond is located at carbon number one, right? So this would be one dash octine. Again, the one is for where on those eight carbons you have the triple bond. We still have actually a group attached, right? And that is the guy kind of hanging out there at the bottom. And uh, that would be actually I'm use the different color, maybe. I'll do that one. Uh, that's this group right here, which is really one carbon, two carbons, and three carbon group. And once again, uh, so you can see those carbon. It is, this would be one carbon. It would not be this one because that's part of the main group. So we can't count it twice. Uh, that would be a carbon and that would be a carbon there. So that's three carbons. Three carbons is based off of propane, but it is a group. So it becomes a propyl group, yeah. 
We do have to give the location of where that propyl group, and it is at carbon number four. We don't renumber. So once we settle on a numbering, we keep it for everybody. So this would be four dash propyl dash one octine. Yeah. Any questions on that name there? Any question? Yeah. Yeah. So in Josh is always between a number and a letter, or if you have a letter to a number, you use the dash. And the comma is always between two numbers. So if you have two numbers back to back, you should use a comma. And that's why here, and what I mean by uh, kind of number to a letter, letter to a number, here we use the dash as we went from a number to a letter, but here we went from a letter to a number, so we use the dash as well. So you can use it in both instances. But the comma would only be used when you got basically two numbers that back up to each other in the name, and that's the only time we use it. Other questions? <clears throat> okay. So we sort of started naming it here, and obviously our comparison of our alkanes, alkenes, and alkynes. Again, everything coming back to those alkanes. And really, uh, for a lot of things, the functional groups, I mean, it's sort of how you end the naming of it if it's there. And it's always really the functional group that takes the priority. The only place really sort of the functional group doesn't take the priority is with alkanes. It's the groups that take the priority in terms of numbering. But once you start getting everything else that's a functional group like a double bond or triple bond they always take the priority in terms of the numbering to the smallest um so once you uh name these and want we also draw a couple which you should do the same sort of method as we've done before let's do um let's do three methyl uh we'll do three methyl Two, let's see, two pentene. And let's do um, <clears throat> the heptine. Do five ethyl. Three ethyl. All right. So, guys on the left, give the proper name. Uh, guys on the right, draw it up. Okay. Let's take a look to see how you're doing. We'll start here on the left. Uh, so, once again, we want the longest carbon chain that has double bond in it. Uh, so, we got one, two, three, four, and five. Other option would be one, two, three three, four, and five down, which looks like the same. Uh, I think that's all your options in that case. So since they're both the same, might as well take the one uh, we started with there, uh, which will give us this. All right, so that is, uh, what did I say there? One, two, three, four, five. So five is based off of pentane. Uh, we have a double bond, so that is gonna give us a pentene. And in this case, uh, the double bond would be located at carbon number two, as we would want a number in this direction. Obviously, if we go in the other way, our carbon, our double bond would be at carbon number three, right? So that's too big. So that's going to be uh, two pentene. That then will lock our group here into place and that is a methyl group and that is a carbon number four so that's going to be four methyl two pentene any questions on that name there all right god's bottom has a triple bond action happening here so we got uh one carbon here to two carbons there through the triple bond to three carbons the four carbons, the five carbons to six carbons. Yes. 
So that is six carbons. And once again, uh, to see that it should be uh, one, two, three, four, five, and six in this case. So six carbons is based off of hexane. It has a triple bond, which means it will become hexine. And we should number left to right or right to left in this case. We should go right to left here, as that will give our triple bond a number of two. If we went the other way, our triple bond would end up with a number of four, right, which is larger. So we do want to go in that direction. So that's going to be two hexine here. Yes. Any questions on that there? <clears throat> All right, so to draw it, uh, we're going to go backwards in the name. Uh, so we got pentene. So the pentane part tells us it's five carbons. The ENE tells us it's a double bond, and that double bond should be located at carbon number two in this case. So once again, since you are drawing it, you could go left to right or right to left. I'm going to go left to right, and that means that my carbon number two would be there. So that's where I'm going to put my double bond at my carbon two in that case. Obviously, if you went the other way, your carbon two would be there. Yes, if you drew it that way. Um, and you would put the double bond to the left, obviously, in that case. So I did that. That takes care of this and that. Because I put my double bond at this as carbon number two, that means that carbon number three should be where my methyl group would be. Since that's carbon one for me, carbon two, carbon three, carbon four, and carbon five. Uh, and that takes care of that. At this point, everything else will be hydrogens, right? To get us to four bonds. Let me get rid of those numbers so don't get too confusing here. So we'll get rid of some of these numbers here. All right, so now to fill it out here with our hydrogens, uh, this guy will need three to get to four bonds. He'll need two. This guy right here will need none. It's got four lines already, right? So it's got four bonds. Guy next to it will need one, and this guy will need three. Yes, so you just want to watch out. Don't put hydrogens where they do not need them. Any questions on that one there? You could if you want to. Uh, this would be the condensed structure is what I drew. Uh, if you did the line structure, we have, what, five? Yeah, so we'll have uh, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, five. You could draw something like this. And then at carbon number two would be our double bond. So you would draw something like that. And our methyl group would be a carbon number three. So you draw something like that. Okay. Yeah. And that obviously would be the line structure. What I drew would be the condensed structure. And then uh, if you needed the expanded, you would draw the condensed just with all the hydrogens attached. Yeah. Other questions? Are, are we talking about uh, for even? On the line structure, it doesn't. Typically, people will kind of draw it down because it kind of come. It looks like they're kind of connecting downward. Technically speaking, if you drew it up, it's the same thing. But yeah, as long as it's again on that carbon there, then it should be okay. Other questions? Um, so here we have heptine. So heptane is seven carbons. So that would be the basis of what we want to start with here. One, two, three, four, five, six, and seven so i'm going to do the condensed formula again here yne tells us it's a triple bond and it is at carbon number three so i once again i'm going to go left to right so that's going to be my carbon number one which means my carbon number three is here and i should triple bond it up then at five i should have an ethyl group so since that's my carbon three next to it would be carbon four here carbon five would be right about there and that is an ethyl group which is a two carbon group and at this point, everything else is going to be hydrogen. So we'll finish our group there. Uh, this would have three. Uh, this would have two. This would have one. The carbon number four will have none since it has four lines. Carbon number three will also have none because it has four lines. Uh, carbon number two will have a couple. And carbon number one will have three of them here. Uh, if you did sort of line structure on this, uh, you could go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. 
And again, a carbon number three, one, two, three would be our triple bond if you did it that way. And at carbon number five, so that would be three, four, five, we would have our ethyl group, uh, which you could do something like that if you like, yes. Or you could flatten out the triple bond to a straight line if you wanted to do it like that. Any questions on that? All right, two more things I want to talk about before we go here. So I appreciate your patience. Uh, and it has to do with naming cycloalkenes. So naming cycloalkenes uh, is a little bit different than how we name cycloalkanes. Uh, we do need to give the location of where groups are attached, even if it's just one group. And that is because it has a double bond in the actual cycloalkene. Um, and the double bond would take the priority. So if we look at this guy down here, without anything attached, this is still five carbons, uh, which means it's based off of cyclopentane, but because it does have a double bond, it would be cyclopentene. Now, when we put the group here, we do not have to give the location of where that double bond is located, but it should be carbon number one. And we still need to give the group that's attached here the smallest number. But there is a way that you have to number a cycloalkene, which is you have to number and go through the double bond. So you cannot go away from the double bond. So what I mean by that is, you could not call this number one and then go away from it and call that number two because we did not go through the actual double bond when we numbered it, which means the two ways that you have options to number this guy would be to start with one there, go through the double bond to two. This would be three, this would be four, and this would be five. The other way that you could number this would be to start at this end of the double bond and call that carbon number one. Going through it, that would be carbon two, that would be carbon three, carbon four, and carbon five. In this case, which way should we go to give that group the smallest number? We go the red way, right? The red way gives it carbon number three. If you want the blue way, you would end up at carbon number five. So this is how we would get to the name that you see here, three methyl cyclopentene. So when you do have a ring structure, it has a double bond, it still takes priority. Even if it's just one group attached, you still have to give the number because the double bond will take the priority in terms of numbering. You do have to number through the double bond one way or the other. You can't go away from the double bond. And again, whichever way you need to get that group, the smallest number is how you should number it. Question on that there. Yeah, so if we were to look, say, at this guy that has nothing attached, right? This is six carbons in a ring structure, right? So this is based off a of cyclohexane. It has a double bond, which means this guy would be cyclohexene, E-N-E. -E. You do not need to give the number in this case because there's no other group attached. And wherever that double bond is located is assumed to be carbon number one. So either this is carbon one or this is carbon one over here. This is a little different, right? The big group here is our ring, which is a five member ring. And it has a double bond, which means it is cyclopentene, E-N-E. -E. We have a methyl group there and a methyl group there, which means we have a dimethyl situation happening. Yes. Now, when we go to number this, there's our two options is this, it is, we could start with the, let me kind of clear out some of that there. Maybe, there we go. All right, let's clear this out. So if we go to number, we could start with this as one, we have to go through the double bond to two, to three, to four, to five. If we numbered the other way, we would start here. One, two, three, four, and five. Should we go clockwise or counterclockwise in this case? Which way gave the smaller number? Yeah, going this way, right? Through the bond gave us a three. 
So this would be a situation as an earlier question, three comma three, as we use the comma between the two numbers, dimethyl cyclopentene. Yeah, in this case. So when you do have that double bond in a cyclo uh, alkene, you do have some number through it and you do have to give the number. Obviously, if we had other groups of tasks like we did here. We got to get the location of all the groups. Questions on that there. All right. Thank you for hanging out.